Our next speaker is Max Hoffman. He uses he, him pronouns. He is currently a PhD student with Benjamin Jurekovic at the Humboldt uh, HUT in Berlin. Um, and he measures neural activity from translucent fish. Take it away, Max. Uh, yeah. Thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about um, oblique plane microscopy for whole brain imaging of Daniel Nenner transducida. And our lab works on a new model organism. It's called Daniel Nenner transducida. And um, it's very interesting for neuroscientific imaging studies, basically we, uh, for three things. Um, first thing is that it's transparent throughout its adulthood. And a second thing is that it has um, the smallest known vertebrate brain. And uh, you can see it here. Um, and since it's transparent and, um, and it's so small, an additional good thing about it is that we can, um, that it's a minimal to genetic modification and we can express, for example, calcium indicators throughout the whole brain. And all these things make it very interesting uh, for imaging studies. And of course, uh, the first thing you ask is what would be the right scope to kind of actually image the whole brain of this fish. And uh, of course, uh, um, different techniques come to mind. First of all, uh, to photon point scanning here on the left, um, which obviously would have the, the right field of view up to five millimeters to accommodate the brain. But um, as is known, it's relatively slow because you have to come sequentially step through all the uh, voxels in, in the specimen. Yeah? And uh, an alternative to this is light sheet where you exceed a, uh, thin sheet of, uh, excite a thin sheet of light throughout, throughout the brain. And then you capture a camera image. So you can capture actually a whole plane at once. Um, and you're very fast and the resolution is still good. But here you require access from the side uh, to the specimen. And even in the transparent fish like ours, um, the axis from the side is occluded by eyes, cartilage, or some bone structures. Yeah? Um, this is why we thought that uh, the technique called oblique plane microscopy might be the right choice, um, which is basically similar to a light sheet microscope, but everything works through one objective. So you excite an oblique plane in the specimen, and then you capture the emitted light. Um, so I can quickly walk you through a normal or conventional setup of, of OPM. Yeah? Um, here we would couple a blue laser inside uh, at the side of an objective. And this would excite the oblique plane, um, which gives the technique its name. And then um, uh, the emitted fluorescence could be captured by the very same objective. And uh, by scanning this laterally, you could kind of um, puzzle together a volume. Yeah? But in order to kind of um, record this oblique plane, um, you usually uh, have to do a re-imaging trick where you kind of put another system back to back and create a very small one-to-one -one image of the specimen, and then bring a third objective, a third microscope, which basically then images the, the oblique plane onto a camera sensor. So the brain of um, our fish, Daniela Transucida, is uh, two millimeter by one millimeter by 0 0.6 millimeter approximately. And uh, no conventional oblique plane microscopy with this kind of field of view exists. And um, this basically has to do with this re-imaging step step where, as you see in this graph, um, it's inevitable that you lose portions of the light because some of the light is not uh, propagating anymore in the, in the cone of the second objective. Um, and uh, in optical design, it's very well known that um, those angle, which we, this angle, which we basically call the numerical aperture of the system, um, correlates with the field of view. So high numerical aperture, high large angles usually mean small field of views and low numerical aperture, which are shallow angles, mean uh, large field of views. So here, and, and this is the problem, because here you see that basically, once you go to lower angles and larger field of views, this problem um, with the lost light becomes um, a very severe one. And um, in the end, you lose almost all the light. So for example, in a system like ours, which works at 0.5 NA, um, you see here that if we would build a setup in a way um, as you usually do with OPM, um, all light would be lost. So therefore, um, we thought of a new way of doing this, uh, which we call image transfer oblique plane microscopy, um, where we basically insert a face plate, a fiber optic face plate, which is tapered on one side and guides the light from the oblique plane to a straight plane, which can then be imaged on, um, yeah, onto a camera as in a normal OPM. So with this technique, we are able to um, reach a field of view of two millimeter by 1.4 millimeter 
times one millimeter and the resolution, which is approximately two micron by two micron by 40 micron axially. So now with this technique at hand, we can um, go, uh, proceed to kind of try to image Daniela Transcida and its brain. And um, indeed we can do this now at, and we capture a volume like this at um, approximately one Hertz or at one Hertz. Um, so 300 planes per second. And um, with this kind of tool right now, we can actually start to um, map whole sensory pathways um, at one Hertz, like here during audio stimulation. Um, yeah. And um, I guess this uh, hopefully puts us in a position to, uh, yeah, start to address some, yeah, interesting questions about the brain. And yeah, so with this, I'll conclude. And uh, yeah, I want to thank my lab. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to uh, take your questions or uh, lead into the discussion. Cool, thank you so much, uh, Max. So I have a question actually, I don't know very much about translucent fish. Um, what is mm -hmm. happening in that, in that video that you showed us where you see the fish kind of moving? Uh, you mean in the neuroimaging video? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah, I think so. Basically, we have to. So the fish are embedded in an agarose matrix, yeah, and um, but they are awake and they are not paralyzed. So um, you sometimes during this um, or during this recording, the fish basically twitch, and uh, so this movement is so strong that you even uh, as those are those videos are motion corrected, but yeah, those um, movements are so fast that you cannot actually correct for it. And then when analyzing those recordings, we would just exclude those frames. Cool. Um, I see also now that uh, Martin posted a question for you in the Q and A. He's saying, mm -hmm. "Really awesome. What is your spatial resolution?" Uh, yeah, like I say. Uh, so, uh, like I said, so the optical resolution here is basically two by two by fourteen micron. Yeah, um, and of course, you see here that um, even in a tiny brain like this, when you uh, when you want to penetrate an image deeper, um, you start to uh, see scattering effects. Um, uh, this, of course, uh, yeah, I mean, lowers the resolution more. Yeah? Um, I think maybe this question, I hope this answers the question. Cool, thank you. And so what do you think is the next step in this project going to be? Uh, yeah, um, like I said, um, so one thing, one interesting thing about um, Daniela Transcida is that they Acoust like communicate acoustically with their conspecifics. So um, we are currently working, uh, yeah, trying to um, find out how those sounds of conspecifics, those like um, yeah innate sounds they produce, or, or it's not clear whether they're innate or not, but um, uh, yeah, how they might be processed in the in the auditory pathway, and maybe differently from other sounds. Yeah? Um, so say question or those are, might be the next steps. But of course, um, I think there are like, yeah, I, I think there are many interesting questions uh, yeah, which, which you could ask. And the, the nice thing is that it's a very high, uh, the, the, the throughput of this technique is very high. So um, this in, in like 20 minutes, you can basically map out um, the whole brain and responses. So for example, whatever. So, so changes from one day to the other, you could with le very little experimental effort and principle kind of track. Yeah? And yeah, I guess that's what makes it very interesting also. Hmm. I think Jeremy has another question. Jeremy, do you want to pop on and ask again? Yeah, I just had a question of what type of analysis you plan to do after that, because we can do a, I think, I'm not completely familiar with, with working with that model, animal model, but you can do like olfactory related task or social task, things like that. Hmm. Yeah, so for now uh, in our lab, like we don't have the real task that we established so far. So, so far we, um, we restrict ourselves or um, in these early stages to actually do replay studies where we yeah, try to map the sensory per, uh, pathway um, without any kind of task that the fish might, um, might perform. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, yeah. It's little work. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I guess, uh, but yeah, pe so people in the lab are kind of pursuing those things. And uh, yeah, I think eventually, I guess, uh, things will then come together. Hmm. Cool, thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question. Max, there's another question for you uh, from Alina in the Q&A. Um, they're hmm. asking how comparable is the size uh, um, of the adults 
from your translucent fish to a larval zebrafish? And do you think it will be possible uh, to do recordings from larval to adult stage in this model? Uh, yeah, so, okay. So it's a world that I had a larval zebrafish under the scope, but I think, so I guess larval zebrafish would be, uh, the length of a larval zebrafish brain would be maybe at around 0 0.6 millimeter or something. Um, maybe at six days or so. So uh, yeah, so this is the comparison. I think it's maybe yeah, two to yeah, uh, no, three times, uh, 3.5 times uh, longer, yeah, larger. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's very well possible that, or like the second, uh, the answer to the second question would be yeah, that I think it's, it's possible to, to image um, the organism through, through development. <laughs> Throughout the developmental stages. Yeah, yeah throughout the developmental stages. Uh, yeah. Um, yes, here also had a question for you. Um, they're asking, can you image the fish upside down as to improve the resolution of the side that is like less, yeah, well visible now? Um, so I think. Um, yeah, I, I, okay, sorry. Is there, no, I didn't want to interrupt you. No, I just wanted to say. Oh, okay about the, the slide that you still have on is really uh, uh, nice to illustrate that because I think that is what they're referring to that the ah, you mean the, the, the rotating volume uh, yeah so I think uh, no we can't I mean the fish has other organs yeah so it has the like the mouth and things that are situated below and it also has a jaw right so um, it's after all like a vertebrate which has some bones so I don't think that it would be the right uh, direction so I think it's less transparent from from the bottom so I think if you want to kind of go, or I think there are certain things which you might like computational do, or you could try to think about structured illumination approaches, even in this OPM microscope. Um, apart from this, eventually, I think you have to, um, yeah, like switch to a two photon microscope. And obviously you could also think about a two photon oblique plane microscope, micros uh, microscope. Um, but uh, yeah, I, so the signal, I, I guess the signal would be much lower and I wouldn't, I'm not sure how well it would work. I think those, yeah, mm -hmm. where yeah, are the kind of directions I would take. Mm. Cool, okay. Um, I think we are getting close to uh, the end of this session. I don't know if okay. uh, anyone has uh, still a question.